Hey everybody, Jerry Chuk here from Drop Time Ridge, and today is episode number three of our three-part mini-series on shed hunting. And we're going to be talking sheds as always, and dogs. And we got an expert guest with us. He's got quite the extensive resume. He's worked with North American Whitetails, Whitetails Unlimited, Gun Dog Magazine, Legendary Whitetails. His dog, Taylor, is the official mascot for Whitetails Unlimited. He is the dog bone hunter himself, Jeremy Moore. How you doing, buddy? I'm doing well. I appreciate you for having me, Jerry. Appreciate it. Hey, I'm, I'm glad you're here. I'm, uh, we're hoping to help some people out and get them in the woods and training their dogs to find some sheds. We yeah. got uh, we got shed rally coming up here March 13th and 14th. Are you going to be uh, doing anything with that this year? We are. We always we always work with uh, pretty good friends of ours over there at Whitetail Properties, and shed rally is obviously right up our alley. So um, we have been a part of it from a sponsorship standpoint for the last several years. Um, we usually do we we've I think the last two years we've provided them with some content um, leading up to shed rally, training tips, things to do with your dogs. We've done some series for them. This year I just was on the phone with them last week actually, and we're going to do something a little bit different. Uh, I'm kind of excited about it. We're we're going to and we're going to record it actually. Ben's going to be in tomorrow. We're going to record it the pro, the kind of the promo for it, but we're going to team up with them and offer a 40 of, of like a 45 minute like a zoom call like we're doing right now um training consultation specifically to talk shed dogs with one a winner so they're gonna we're gonna put it out through the whitetail properties pages and then our dog 100 pages and pick a winner through through that social through facebook and instagram and then uh we'll do like a like a one-on-one -on -one talk of the, anything they want to talk shed dog training oh, wow. so yeah so a little bit different than what we've done in the past i think it's you know, we, I like doing these things because, and I like doing it this way. We've actually gotten into it a little bit ourselves with some training consultations. We don't offer them. We have a lot of people that ask about them. Um, it's not something that we're really set up to do from a time, time standpoint. We just, it's, it's tough to make them work. Um, and I think honestly, if we offered it, it would be, we'd be scheduling them all day long and we, I wouldn't get my rest of my stuff done. So instead, um, but there's so many people that are asking about it, especially this time of, of where we are in life, as far as COVID stuff and so many people home, so many people trying to train their own dogs in the last 12 months. Um, I think our kind of mission is to help folks with that. So, uh, we've decided that we're, we're not going to offer it as a, uh, something that we sell or offer as like, a um, something that you can coordinate and schedule with us. Instead, we've been giving them away. And so we've been using, using some of our social platforms to pick random winners. Um, we just did one that's going to air pretty quick. Um, a, a gal in the UK, actually, this is the cool part about the computer part. I mean, we can touch people yeah. from all across the world. So there was a gal in the UK, super nice, su su great couple. They've got a young pup. They've been following our stuff. Um, they've been very real active actually with, with posting stuff, commenting on stuff, sharing stuff. And, uh, they won and we ended up, wow. uh, reaching out to his name was Matt and we reached out to him and we surprised him as on his birthday. So it was, oh, nice. uh, yeah, she, he had no idea. He thought it was gonna be a zoom call with family because they are <laughs> completely in lockdown over there. And wow. so here we are on the other end. And I don't know if he was excited or disappointed thinking he was going to talk to his family, but we had a great <laughs> conversation. We had a few beers uh it was awesome it was really cool so we're going to do that with whitetail properties here coming up in the next week that is awesome man that's uh that's quite the gift for your birthday right there yeah I, totally uh, right I, I, it was more fun for me i think to surprise him because the look on his face is pretty priceless oh yeah that's that's cool man that's really cool um so moving forth how how can uh they get involved with that so the what they'll end up doing is we'll we're going to shoot a little video explaining the rules i think it's gonna be real simple you're going to like whitetail properties page you'll like our dog bone hunter page and then you'll just make a comment um and tag somebody into it uh tag, i think it's, it makes sense to tag somebody into it that you think would benefit from it um and then we'll be just picking a random winner so watch the whitetails unlimited or the whitetail properties um so, social pages instagram and facebook and then dog bone hunters social uh, you know facebook and instagram and that's where we'll be posting that it'll be, it'll, awesome. it'll go this week um it'll be the what is this week it's the the first i guess first of march day. right now so um we'll probably have it live by march 3rd that's awesome yeah it's flying by well there you go folks an awesome uh, awesome chance to uh, get some really great knowledge and everything there so you definitely want to look into that um so moving forward i had the privilege to spend deer camp with you a couple years ago 
down in Kansas. We had a good time, um, didn't we? We had a blast down at uh, Wicked Outfitters in the same Kansas. Um, we both came up in the empty handed, but you know what? We had some great memories on there, some great friendships that we had. Totally. And really enjoyed myself. And it was there that you really kind of made me interested in what you call a deer dog. Sure. Um, I knew I wanted a dog. I didn't know what kind, uh, didn't have any background, no training or anything like that. And uh, I was pretty sure I was going to kidnap Taylor at one point, but I wouldn't yeah. get away with it. Um, <laughs> That's on people. So I, I ended up having to get my own dog, Sadie, which I'm absolutely really, really pleased with. Um, and I started off online just kind of researching things. I know, I believe you go down south to get your dogs. What, how do you pick your dog out and what sets that dog apart from the others? Well, yeah, over the years, I've, I've gotten dogs from several different places, several different kennels. I think there's a lot of good ones out there. Um, we're actually, we've since then probably, um, we've shifted a little bit more towards um, with selective breeding, we're able to purchase and, and acquire genetics that, that I find real desirable. I think it's, when I say desirable, it's desirable based on preference. And so I prefer a real, a, a very distinct certain style of dog. Um, I've, I've over the years gotten to know exactly what I like and what I'm looking for. I've learned a lot about different lines and genetics um specific breedings that have thrown pups that I that, that fit really well and I, I you know I think I think it is very important to match up what I consider the right dog for you and that doesn't necessarily mean it's the right dog for me or the next guy down the road so I I always you know I get tons of people asking me where can I go to get the best dog mm -hmm. and my answer is always well it depends on what you're looking for because it you, where it, where it all comes together, I think, is aligning what I call different styles. Like it's there's a lifestyle that you live, there's a training style that you're going to use to get there from a hunting standpoint, and probably as a family dog as well. So that there's that lifestyle, there's that training style, and then there's that hunt style. And everybody's is a little bit different. Everyone's got a little bit different story. I I use my dogs, as you know, for lots of stuff. I, we track with them, oh, yeah. um, game recovery. We use them for shed hunting in the spring. I hunt birds with them in the fall, both upland and gun dog work. When I say gun dog work, I mean more like waterfall stuff. Um, all of those, all of those things are what we do a lot with our dogs. We also do stuff like my wife took took one of our dogs through um, therapy dog training. So she she cool. it's it's pretty extensive. I mean it's it, it really. You know, me looking at it from the outside, I went, it's just a really good, obedient dog. Like, that's what it takes to right. be able to do that. Now, she did it for the purpose of being able to go and work in hospitals and schools and places that require this certification um, to bring the dogs in. And so that's why my wife did it. She was really inspired by some visits that we did with a local school, um, kids that had uh, autism and different disabilities. Uh, we went, we, we brought our dogs there and we work with this school locally and she got really inspired by that and she likes to help people. So she said, well, I want to take it to old, an old folks home or I want to take her to the hospital. And in order to do that, it required this certification process. So I think that when you look at it from that extent, all the way down to a dog that you're going to go and compete with in a field trial, if that's what you're into, there's, there's a lot of skills that overlap. There's a lot of things there that, ha that that those different tasks have in common from like a behavioral standpoint and from a skill set standpoint. So my my flushing dogs that we hunt grouse with in the fall in Woodcock, uh, they quarter and they cast and they work within a certain range and then they flush, we shoot, they retrieve. My shed dog, if you look at what a shed dog does, they quarter, they cast. They don't necessarily flush, but they too use their eyes and their nose, just like that bird dog did to get to something, recognize it, pick it up and bring it back to me. The only, the, the difference between that is, you know, there's no flush and there's no shot, but the skills, all the other skills, you know, the ability to get out and work within range, the ability to recall in, in situations that are, there's distractions, you jump, you bump a deer. Well, if a, if a pheasant dog is going through CRP field, bumps a deer and runs after the deer, does that make it a bad pheasant dog? It really doesn't have anything to do with pheasant hunting. It has to do with control. It has to do with the ability to stop in a distracting situation and recall the dog back. So 
those skills really transfer across all of the different platforms as far as what you're going to be doing in the field. And so where do you get the best dog? Well, it, that is what has to line up. So different dogs have different styles that fit better for them. I prefer a softer dog. I, I just, I think some people look at soft and it's, you, you tell me you've got a soft dog. I look at that as it's very desirable. Some, I know some people that if I say it's, it's a little soft on the softer side, they look at it as a real negative. They don't want anything to, they don't, that's not their style of training. That's not going to fit for them. They're a little, maybe a little bit heavier handed. Um, they're more into some force methods, um, some avoidance training stuff. A soft dog doesn't work really well for them. They might like a dog that's real hot. You know, I consider a dog that's a little wired, a little hot, um, a yeah. little more drive, a little more go. I look at that and, and you tell me that's the type of dog it is. I'm a little, eh, I'm not that interested in it. Where some, some people go, that's what I need. That fits what I'm doing. So it's matching up those things. And that's what makes the right dog. So, and I, you know, there's, that's, that's a, that's kind of a simplistic way of looking at it, but it's also, you know, then you can, it's just like anything else. You can dig into layers. Dog training is simple. Um, and, and, and generally it's, it's not very complicated, but then you start getting into it a little more involved. And it's just like everything else. Like, uh, uh, you could, you could look at a motor, like a, an engine, combustible mm -hmm. motor and say it's pretty simple like there's compression there's firing you know I, i'm not a, obviously not a mechanic but <laughs> there's compression there's ignition there's things going energy. on yeah there's an there's a, a piston that turns a thing and then the thing turns the wheel so you, you could i can if someone if i knew what i was talking about i could i could describe what a what a combustible motor does and make it sound pretty simple but then you start digging into it and you start changing the rings on the piston and making the thick that we're talking about micro measurements in, in these tolerances and variances that are really, really got to be perfect in order for it to work. So yeah, it's a little more complicated that way, but it's not that complicated. Nothing we do is that complicated. I don't think, you know, like carpentry is pretty simple, but good carpenters don't, they get real involved with it and they get into the fine details and they pay you know, pay close attention to little tricks and things that work well same is true with dog training but matching up the raw material which is the dog to the guy that's going to hold on to the other end of the leash i, I do think that's important probably yeah. the most probably the most non to the point answer you've gotten in a long time <laughs> simple question i i but i oh, yeah. but again that's a simple question that probably can be answered it's very simple i could have said I like a Labrador retriever. I think that's the best one. I think a softer dog is the best. And I think a dog that has some natural inherent traits of retrieve and good game finding ability. And I like a cool temperament. Like that could have been a real simple answer, but I don't know that that's the right answer for everyone that's listening to this right now. It's the right answer for me. Right. But, but if I say that and, and the guy down the road that is going to put an e-collar on his dog and force fetch his dog, says that's the answer goes and grabs that dog brings it back home and it shuts down on them now it wasn't the right answer so i think you gotta under i i, I like to the idea of like looking at it looking at it in a micro way and then looking at it in a macro way and figuring out where you fit in that so how long are you spending with these with these dogs before you make this decision like my dog sadie um I bought her in my work parking lot before my shift. Um, uh, a lady, she was she was selling her litter. Um, it was exactly what I wanted, right in my price range. Sure. Uh, she had the color I liked um, and seemed like a nice dog. I mean, it was maybe a, a five, 10 minute process total. Yeah, you luck, You got really lucky. I mean, it, it, yeah. and that's not, and you're, but you're also a perfect example of like, that can happen. Certainly. Mm -hmm. And, and I think part of it probably has to do with the idea that you prior to getting her, I don't know that you necessarily, if I had asked you before you got her, if I just said, Hey, well, what style of trainer are you? I don't know if you could have gave me a real defined answer. No. So your, your style of training probably was developed as Sadie grew up and it kind of, you, you, you tried to fit it to fit her. And so I don't think you had a set way. And I think that's good. I, I, yeah. I, I'm a believer in the idea of the, the trainer's got to be the one that adjusts. The dogs are the dogs and we have to adjust. Now that 
that's to a degree. Sometimes we have to shape the dog into a desirable way that we're looking for, but I don't think it's like 180 degree difference. So you didn't, you went into it as a relatively blank slate yeah. from a training standpoint. So you got to adjust, you got to paint that the way you wanted to do it. I, I think it, it's great because it worked for you. What, what the issue could have come up is, you know, there's lots of issues that could have come up. And so I'm a, I'm a numbers guy. I was having this conversation with someone the other day and talking about how I like to stack the deck in my favor. I like to have the odds on my side. So yeah. that being said, I have to, when I'm training a dog for a client. And so I, you know, the pressure is on me a little bit differently than it is on yourself, because if it doesn't line up exactly how you want it for you, you're probably still going to be okay with it. You're going to love that dog. That dog's going to love you. You know what? It, it, it's as long as you have realistic expectations going into it, you're not going to lose. I mean, it's going to be fine, but for me, I'm selling a dog to someone based on what they've seen with my other dogs. That's the reason they chose to buy a dog from me. And the reason they did it is because they said, I want one just like that. And so for me to be able to replicate something in this, in this world, there ha there, that dog comes into it as a big factor. And so for me to, to have consistency with an end product, I can't, I can't replicate the dogs. Like the, every dog's a little bit different. I'm training one right now named Callie. I just finished training one named Bella. We did a series on our YouTube channel with those and they're, they're dramatically different. They're, they're very distinctly different. Now I think they're distinctly different. That's the micro stuff on the macro. You could look at it and be like, they're very similar. They're both mm -hmm. real sweet, soft dogs. Um, they're both about the same size. They both have real natural inherent traits that, lend themselves well to the field so they have a lot of stuff in common but there's also some things that are distinctly different and so I look at that and I go they're close enough that I can by the time we're done with them we're going to have a really similar product as far as end of the end of the road with the dog as far as the training when it, when I turn it over and give it back to the owners but right. the route that I take to get there is going to be a little bit different and so but I train a bunch of them you know, right. you're, you're in, in your lifetime, you won't, you won't train as many. So mm -hmm. that's why it's so important for me um, to be able. And that's why we've taken on some breeding of our own, because I've actually, I'm in the works right now. I've got two dogs that I, I, one of them is I've trained like nine dogs out of her lineage. It's her, it's the third generation of it. And we're going to, I've purchased some breedings from the UK that we're going to wow. be pairing up and breeding with her. The breeding that I bought from the UK is the sire of Bella, the dog that I just got to training. So I have like really good knowledge of both lines. And so right. I feel really strongly about that pairing. I think we should be able to produce a pretty, um, pretty, uh, a, a dog that I think is going to be, we can, we can predicate based on history that I think I'm going to like the style. I, I have another dog here that, well, it's Taylor's puppy. So I've trained Taylor. I've had puppies out of Taylor's parents that I've worked with. So I have this again, third generation type stuff. And we're going to put, we're looking at breeding her to this sire. So we're going to have like, the reason I'm doing it is not, be, it's because I think it's going to give me a better chance of fitting the right dog for me and ultimately my client than what I potentially could go by. And right. there's a lot of good, there's a lot of good dogs out there. I mean, yeah, there's a ton of them. There's, there's a lot of good ones. There's a lot of, a lot of them that aren't so good for me, not to say they're not good for the next guy, but I just, right. I always tell people, you gotta, you gotta match that stuff. up. I, you know, I think you hit the nail right on the head. I mean, with, with that answer there, um, you're right. I was a, a novice. I didn't know anything. Uh, watched some of your videos, talked with you a little bit, learned as I, as I went along. Um, and I'm still learning. It's, it's sure. crazy. Heck, uh, me too. <laughs> Last year it was it was funny. So I took Sadie out. We're doing a run. Um, we we found a I found a little spike um, here in Michigan. You know they're not monsters yeah. or anything. Yeah. And I worked her in that area, and she eventually found it. I'm like, this is great. You know, this is good. So then we continue on to this uh, this next area. Um, I do these things called speed tours, where prior to shed season, I'll go online and I'll find a bunch of areas. Um, that have high concentrations of oaks because I hunt a lot of public land. 
Yeah. And I got to focus where those, where those deer are at. So I focus sure. on those areas there and uh, we moved to the next area and it was just, it was picture perfect, man. I had my camera in my hand. I saw the biggest shed I've ever seen in my life about a hundred yards up. I'm excited. And Sadie's 30 yards ahead of me. I'm jumping up and down. I'm like, I can't believe that this is going to be awesome. I start working her downwind of it. And keep in mind, this has been a couple hours um, since we've been out there now. Sure. And she's going right to it. I'm getting excited. Good girl. Good, good, good. And she doesn't run. She doesn't walk. She trots literally right over it and I think her leg even nicked it at one sure. point and I'm just like oh my god what happened yeah uh, and I really had to think about it and kind of ask those questions why um just like I do do hunting why should I hunt here why why are the deer using this area and I realized that I wasn't hunting sheds the way I was training sure so now what I'm doing is every 20, 30 minutes, I'm throwing an antler down and I'm walking her downwind of it, just helping her with that confidence. And sure. it seems like that's helped a lot. Well, think about it. Dogs learn stuff through repetition and consistency. Like that's, that's what training is. It's shaping behavior. It's forming habits through, by doing something repetitious and consistently. And so in tra you're right. Training and hunting are totally different. And so, and it's tough to replicate. And so I look at I look at the, I mean, we can do the best we can, but we have to understand that the real thing is different. And so yeah. it's, it's similar when you start talking about like a bird dog. So pheasant hunting is a good one to make a comparison to. So you can practice in your yard. You can prepare the dog as much as you want. Taking them hunting is very different than what you practiced for in the yard. And so, but the yes, difference absolutely. between shed hunting and pheasant hunting is for pheasant hunting, you can prepare them and then take them hunting. And you have a lot of opportunities to replicate that and have the light bulb turn on. You get this, I, I always call them light bulb moments. It's when, the, when it clicks and makes sense. You can see it. It's, the, it's one of the more rewarding parts of being a dog trainer. It's exciting to see the light bulb turn on. And so it's exciting for us as trainers to have this light bulb turn on. Imagine what it is when, the, when it turns on for the dog. So yeah. I look at that and I see a pheasant dog that I've worked with maybe taped wings to a dummy, maybe use some cold game. I maybe even use some fresh killed game. I've done stuff in the yard under controlled situations and got them kind of understanding. Then we go out pheasant hunting. Well, if I go pheasant hunting, a nice transitional step is a game farm, like a shooting preserve. Yeah. So I can yeah. go to a shooting preserve and quite honestly, if I want to, if I can afford to do it, my dog could, my dog could get on 50 to hundred birds a day. Wow. No, pro no problem. Wow. And so, you know, 50 to 100 flushes shot retrieve opportunities is, is, you know, for the first 10, the dog might not do very well, but then all of a sudden the light turn, light bulb turns on yep. because, because in the first hour and a half, it had 10 opportunities. Well, if we, let's just say it's the first hour in one hour, you flushed, you got, you had, a, you had 10 birds to hunt every six minutes on, by average, every six minutes, the dog had a chance to practice this thing. And it didn't do it right the first time. So I made an adjustment the second time and it didn't do it exactly right the second time, but I made an adjustment the third time and the fourth time and the fifth time until I made adjustments, micro adjustments to help this dog. Remember, I'm not going out there just to hunt these birds at a preserve. I'm going out there for training purposes. Right. So I make these little micro adjustments that first 30, 40, 50 minutes. Then we get on that sixth bird, the last 10 minutes of the hour and the and the dog does it right does it per, does it really well flushes shot retrieve boom then we go on to the next field and there's another 10 birds for us to hunt and all of a sudden the first the second bird uh it's we've taken a break and it kind of it's it's not perfect it's a little rusty and then all of a sudden by the third bird it flush shot yep. retrieve boom do it five six seven eight nine ten of those then we do it again in the afternoon and by the end of that day my dog's seen so many different scenarios had the had the ability to make the mistakes it needed to make get corrected for it when i say corrected i don't mean in a negative way i mean like set it up right. better set it up successfully and then all of a sudden the light bulb turns on and that dog turns into a little flusher and the dog turns into a little retriever and the dog and then you hit a cripple and the dog tracked the cripple and brought it back to you now the confidence is just booming in that right, dog. Right. now 
you can do all that really quickly in the controlled setting of a game farm where shed hunting for sheds i mean what 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 was the last season you picked up 100 sheds never uh last year actually was my best my best one i got how many did you find here 17 i mean that's a good year yeah by most most (laughs) people there's a there are the majority of the listeners that are listening to this if they're honest they won't pick they're not going to pick up 17 sheds this year they might be picking up 17 sheds in their lifetime like yeah that's the reality of shed hunting there aren't sheds littered everywhere you don't just step on them they're not all over the place there are spots that are really good i've i've had 100 shed seasons I haven't had one for five, six years now, but I did, I did three, three, I didn't get three seasons of it. I had two seasons in my life where I picked up over a hundred. It was always my goal. Yeah. (laughs) And in the first, the first three years or four years that I shed hunted, I don't think I found four sheds in four years, but I got a lot better at it because I did it a lot more and I figured out where I should look and where I shouldn't look. And then I got on better property and I realized I can be the best shed hunter in the world, but if I go up to Northern Wisconsin where my cabin is, the best yeah. shed hunter in the world isn't going to find 10 sheds up there this year because nope. there just aren't that many. And the, okay. the ground is a lot bigger. There, It's a lot more challenging. Where I can go to a place where we hunt over in Buffalo County and I, I know guys that pick up 100 plus a year, no problem, because they have the opportunity to do it there. That's the game farm. That's, that's okay. the game farm setup. So, but it's real. It's the real thing. It's just, we don't, not everybody has the opportunity to expose the dogs to that. So for myself included, I've watched dogs that I've trained and felt real prepared with walk over sheds and trip on them. Mm-hmm. And then I've had to, and it, so here's the struggle though. And it sounds like you did it, but a lot of people don't is when those moments happen, you last year, you had 17 opportunities to f- try to get a dog to get the light bulb to turn on that 17 <laughs> opportunities was spread out over the course of two months i don't know yeah two to three months so it wasn't like it was real focused or concentrated so so you didn't you the frustration that comes in when that dog walks over the antler it's real easy to lose the cool it's real easy to get frustrated it's really easy to get mad at the dog and the dog reads us better than we can read the dog and all of a sudden the dog decides i don't even like this anymore all he does is get mad (laughs) like it's not fun so what we have to do is we have to, A, I, I got into this thing where I go, count to 10, 1,001, 1,002, 1,000, count to 10. It t- I, I didn't even just do it now because it's so awkward and would take us. <laughs> a to do it. That, that's enough time for you to just take a deep breath and go, all right, where's the problem? Right. What's the issue? Is he, is it a wind thing? Is he not scenting it? Is he not seeing it? Is it just a small piece coming out of the snow? Is it, is it, what, what is the issue? And maybe you can come up with it. Maybe you can't, but what you have to do is like, literally we did it with a, a, uh, at a workshop once we had a gal and we had an, an antler that was out in the woods that we had found. And we let her basically stand over the dog and come on, find it. Give that hunt command, hunt command, hunt command, hunt command, yeah. hunt command, hunt command, hunt command. Until the dog found it, when the dog did, that's when you got to explode with the excitement of you did it. Right. And that's that eureka right. moment for the dog to say, that's what you wanted me to do. That's it. That's all <laughs> I had to do for you to get so excited. That's that but, light bulb. But most, yeah, that's a light bulb. Those are those, you do that yeah. enough, light bulbs turn on. But the problem is, is we start smashing the light bulbs because we're pissed. <laughs> So oh, yeah. instead of allowing that, because it is frustrating. Oh yeah. So, but but it's 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 allowing ourselves to get past that and be okay with the idea of and all of this comes with realistic expectations. And most of the problems that people have in training is unrealistic expectations. That's mm-hmm. whether it's shed hunting or anything else. I'm just gonna push play on my thing here quick. Sure. Okay. So I think that's, I do think that's a big, big part of it. You know, put it into perspective, seven, your best year you've ever had. And you had 17 chances for it to make sense to the dog. Yep. That's, that's asking a lot. So I always tell people, I think it might take a couple of seasons, might take a couple of good seasons before a dog really turns into what I consider to be a shed dog. I've got dogs right now that last year we hardly shed hunted COVID came and it was just, yeah. people were, I, we were, we didn't know if we were allowed to travel. We didn't know. So yep. we don't have real good shed hunting right here by my house. We do a lot of trips and, and we've had a lot of success going to certain areas that are real target rich, 
And we just didn't do it last year. So now as I go this year, I go, I've got our own personal dogs, which is three of them. They've all picked up antlers before, but I would completely expect them to be relatively rusty with the idea of what are we hunt now we've hunted birds in between we've done all sorts of other stuff so i would look at it and go we need to work our way back into it and getting them on a good number of sheds before the light bulb clicks again it'll go quicker this year than it has in the past but we got to do that so um you have a couple products you got the antler you got the uh the kind of a deodorant wax uh stick there and then you have the liquid scent um and all three of them have, have really helped out quite a bit. Um, those are three of the things that you can use for training your dog. Uh, we're going to go back to this dog we just picked up at the kennel sure. today. Sure. Um, sure. And I, I think you absolutely hit it again on the head with, you don't have areas where there's a ton of sheds everywhere. Um, right. So you're using those training things, those training tools to start working with them again. What are we doing as soon as we get home if we're just focusing on that dog to shed hunt, solely well, shed hunt? First things first, there are always foundation. You mm-hmm. can't build a house without a good foundation. So when you bring a dog home, he'll sit, stay, come when I call you. If you can't do that, you can't turn him into a shed dog. You can't right. turn him into any type of hunting dog. Because if you rely 100% on natural inherent hunt, you'll have, you'll have a dog that will hunt for themselves and out of control. And that is no fun no (laughs) you'll you'll leave the dog home because you won't get invited back to places so it's just it's it's never it's like having that it's so my son my son played basketball he's in college now but played high school basketball and through high school basketball and through his youth basketball and all that stuff we played you know school stuff rec stuff aau so we get into aau basketball and and there's everybody plays aau it's not like it's a special thing anymore but so we go to AAU basketball tournaments and we see kids that have a wide variety of skill levels and, yep. and they're supposed to be a little bit better players than the average, you know, this, that, this AAU stuff. So okay. I see these kids play and I see some of them have real good fundamentals and real good foundation is what I call it. They ball handle well, they see the court well, they shoot well, they, they do the skill stuff really well. And then you see some kids that are playing in this that are just straight up athletes very little skill, but a whole lot of athlete. When they're at a young age, I watch these kids play and I look at it and I go, the kid that has the skills and a little bit of athleticism, I mean, you got to have some, there's this balance, right. have some athleticism, you have to have some skills, but the kid that has a real good skill set early on, typically as I watch these kids go through middle school, high school, and some on to college, the ones that rise to the top the best athletic ones in the world can't get past a certain point based on athleticism because at some point the rest of kids catch up with athleticism to a degree the bodies mature they fill out they become better athletes but if they've got a good foundation of skill sets underneath them they get past straight up athletics so dogs that have good natural hunt can do can get you somewhere but without foundation that ceiling is a lot lower than having the foundation and the hunt and the thing about dogs are that that we've bred them for centuries and centuries to be really dialed into certain jobs so those 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 things are pretty powerful so if you most dogs have more natural talent than we'll ever be able to capitalize on in my opinion most dogs are better hunters than we ever get it out of them but it's the ones that we can put the foundation in have the control be able to enjoy i just talked to the person that hunts with their dog they said it's a primarily pet family dog but they're going to hunt a few weeks of the year with it and they wanted to ask questions about how do i go about the hunting part and i said I'm are you talking you, shed hunting then or are you these people are going to do bird these people are going to do upland with it okay upland. so so but this is this could be shed too because okay. there's probably a lot of folks. So here's here's the other thing about this is if you're buying a dog just to shed hunt with, it's a really short window of the year that you're going to be able to use it for. What are you going right. to do with the rest of the year? This isn't a four wheeler that you park in the garage. This isn't right. something, this isn't a food plot implement that gets used in the spring and then it sits in your shed. Like this is a dog. So, yeah. and most people know that and realize and see the value in it beyond just shed hunting or beyond just bird hunting. 
But I, I looked at it and I, I, I see it as the true value in that dog is what it brings to you when you're shed hunting for a short window of time throughout the year. The true value, the bigger value is what did it bring to you when it's not shed hunting? And right. if you don't, so if you've got a dog that hunts like crazy, but you can't take it for a walk, you can't take it camping, you can't take it to the kids' soccer games, you can't go anywhere with it. If you can't travel with it, you can't take it into a hotel room. You can't do anything else but go hunting with it. At best, you're going to use it for a few weeks a year. Right. And so I look at it, I just don't see dogs as tools like that. So I think that person, back to your question, what do you do when you bring them home? You put in a foundation. I spent 10 to 12 months focusing 90% of my effort on that. Now, at the same time, I think you can develop skills that will transition to the field really well, like little hunt command games. I use it. Okay. We, we, we teach, a dog, teach a dog to hold an area. That's where that scent comes in. So we use that scent on a tennis ball. I use that, that wax stick is actually made by a company in Michigan by you, Conquest Scent. Yep. We partner up with them. So Conquest puts our liquid scent into a stick form. That's really nice for in the water. That's really nice for real wet conditions where it's not going to get diluted. I like the wet, I like the liquid scent on a tennis ball because I like to roll it across the grass into cover and lay a trail. It's like a little yep. track for the dog to follow in. So I'm, I'm developing, the reason we use that training dummy is because it looks like an antler, but it'll feel really good in a soft mouth dog's mouth. It would, right. and, and most of these retrievers have been bred to have soft mouths for centuries. So putting that hard horn into a soft mouth dog, I've seen it. I've heard about it. It's become a major issue with a lot of folks in training early on. So we're talking about bringing these dogs home and starting them out. If you introduce them to something that you ultimately want them to like, and you introduce it in a way that they don't like as a puppy, that sticks with them. Gun shy dogs aren't, aren't born gun shy. Dogs that are afraid of antlers because they poke and jab themselves with it. And it's hard. It's not, they weren't born that way. They were created. And so by using that training dummy, I'm not only introducing it in a safe, positive way, but now I'm able to use it in a, a different way. It floats in the water so I can pitch it in the water and let the dog swim out and get it. My dogs love the water. So oh, if, I can yeah. if I can associate something positive with that dog and the shape of an antler, all the better for me with the idea of connecting something good to finding antlers. So I'm able to do that in the summertime. I like them because they allow, you know, they're, they're, they're white. Like I'm, we have white ones and brown ones. It allows me to have some real distinct dramatic color contrast, which is a visual thing. So I'm yeah. getting dogs to recognize that certain shapes are worth going to look at and potentially pick up and bring back to dad. Certain smells are interesting enough for me to go take a look at. Like the scent isn't what makes them pick it up. The scent is what makes them go in investigate it a little bit. And the idea yeah. of the shape is what they understand as there's one of those things that dad gets real excited about. If I bring back, I don't want the dog bringing back sticks. I don't no. want the dog bringing back uh, trash. I don't want, you know, there's, there's a lot of stuff out there that the dog shouldn't pick up. There's some things that I want them to pick up. And so I like the idea of sh conditioning the shape of the antler conditioning the scent of the antler to equal something I should go look at. It's this idea of how do we get these dogs? And it all comes back to the idea of, the dog, the reward for the dog is getting something and bringing it back to dad. And dad gets real excited like that. Yep. Me that way and getting fulfilling that need to retrieve for a retriever is the way I tap into their personalities. Yeah. I, uh, I've seen a guy, uh, I, you know, it's been a couple of years if I remember right. Um, I don't remember his name or anything, but he was on YouTube. And one of the things he did that I thought was interesting, like he'd go areas, the woods, um, soccer fields, football fields, whatever. And he had a cutout of an antler that he actually put on the ground, like a, a 3D cutout. And I thought that was very interesting um, that he would do something like that, just kind of work that with that scent. And then- it's visual, kind of put the Well, it's visual. Yeah, it's, it's, it's this idea of visual. Now I, I don't use that. And I've, I've heard, there's a lot of different ways to do this, but mm -hmm. the idea with that to me is, you know, if you get a dog to come to that location, mm -hmm. first off, you know, I don't know that it needs to be that dramatic. Um, you know, I, I think that the idea of them going to inspect something, I can get, I, I think I can get that usually through the idea of 
it being visual, like our training dummy, pretty right, bright white sitting on shortcut grass. That's right. That, that stands out pretty good. It sticks out. The idea of the, the nose part of it, uh, getting downwind. You got to remember, we, we, I think a lot of times we, we don't give the dog enough credit for the power and the, the value of their nose. Like we know we give deer a lot of credit. We give bear a lot of credit. Our dog's noses are just like that. And so, you know, some people, we a real commonly asked question is the idea of how much scent to you is you don't need very much a drop or two in the right condition. Really the, the, the thing that dictates that is condition, scenting conditions, no different than like, I've, I've been in tough, I, Deer's noses work better in certain conditions, just like dogs do. And so, you know, on dry, cold, real cold days, I've had deer get downwind to me and move through and not wind me. Where yeah. it, it's because it's really tough to scent. Right. It's really tough scenting conditions. You know, you breathe in and when it's when it's 20, we just came out of this big cold polar vortex. When it was 20 below zero air temp, go outside and just take a real deep sucking air through your nose it, hurts. Hurts. it burns yeah. i mean it, yeah. so you're freezing you're literally freezing your nose so you know those different scenting conditions make it easier or more difficult so but yeah there's a there's just there's a ton of ways to do it um i do think it's important to have the understanding of certain things are what i should pick up and bring back and they're not always going to be the same just like they're not always going to smell the exact same but there's a lot of similarities in what they look like there's a lot of similarities in overlaps of scenting layers that are there or not there at times but enough to get the dog that's why we use that scent i mean there's i use about 13 different scenting elements i make that myself and so there's like 13 different clues in there that put into the dog's mind of there's one of those things that i've smelled in the past that when i went over and looked at it it was one of those things that he likes me to pick up and bring back Sometimes those elements are all there. Sometimes they're not, but as long as, but the way dogs process scent in layers allows them to be able to distinguish and pick out certain things there. Hell, there's probably scents on, on antlers that I just, I, I can't replicate, right. but the dogs, if the dog picks up enough antlers, it will start to correlate that specific scent as well as one of those clues. And so when they, when they're moving through the woods or, or through the, the field and all of a sudden they pick up on that layer of scent they go oh, we're there i should go look for this and follow their nose to it and maybe it is an antler maybe it isn't if it isn't they keep moving if it is you pick it up and you bring it back it's just connecting those dots right i like my dog sadie um she just turned four years old i'm she had a little bit of an accident um so i'm hoping i'm hoping that i can get her back out in the woods this year i don't know um we gave kind of a trial run and she was a little sore so we're just gonna yeah. take it easy but yeah. one one of the things that i i found that she is unbelievable at is finding dead deer um sure. the buck that i hunted for two years goliath i'm walking through the swamp i come up and i'm like what in the world sadie's up there what, tail a wagon just going nuts yeah and i'm getting closer and i'm like oh my god it's a big buck and i get up there and uh, sure enough it's a deer i'd been hunting sure um and it was just incredible to see, you know, her get that. Whereas a shed antler, I, I've taken her out now. This is uh, going to be her fourth year, three behind now. Um, she's maybe found five total antlers. Yeah. But was that five that I was going to find? Maybe, maybe not. Right. Um, like I said, when she ran over that antler the one day, um, the next time we went out I, and I don't know if I just missed it or she brought it or what, but I'm walking this area over and I had walked it prior, um, a couple days prior with her and I'm talking on my camera. Um, I'm, I'm doing an interview on it and she comes running up and I just turn around and she's right there and there's an antler just so happens to be right there. So it wasn't sure. like, did she bring it or, you know, right, right. So. But yeah, that was uh, that was one of those holy crap moments. This worked, sure. you know. I'm sure. hoping, you know. Yeah. So. yeah, it's you know, it's it's again, it's it's getting it's getting enough opportunities for it to make sense, and and you'll know, and and you know, I I distinctly remember this one dog that I trained for a, a client of ours, and we we looked and looked and looked, and we picked up a bunch, and it, it was. I was seeing them as quickly as she was. And, but there was this one, we were up on a, we were in the, in Buffalo County, we were up on this bluff and this little goat trail that's coming around the corner. 
and I'm, I'm kind of hugging tight to the edge and, and dogs up ahead of me on the trail. Yeah. And I hear this, I, this unmistakable clicking sound. Well, it was the antler in the dog's mouth. And so she had it in her mouth and she coming her around the corner with me. And that's when I was like, there. I absolutely did not see it, didn't see it before. You know, I knew she picked it up 100% on her own. And that was when I start to develop this confidence in her a little bit more. And I, I do think that that is important, not only from like a personal standpoint of having that confidence, but I think the dog senses that. I think the dog realizes when you believe in the dog, the dog's confidence skyrockets. My dogs beam when they know yeah. they're doing something right. My dogs, I don't even have to make a noise. I don't, my dog does something wrong. It was it happened the other day. Um, Spry came, no, Taylor came back. So Taylor, my wife had let Taylor out and Taylor wandered down by the shop. And so my wife was calling for her and she didn't come back. And so I went outside and I whistled and didn't hear from her, didn't hear from her. And I don't know where she was. Yeah. So I started walking down the driveway and all of a sudden I see her turn the corner and she's coming up the driveway and she was coming on her own. And I don't think she had heard us or anything. And I stood there and just my body language of standing there. I didn't say a word. I didn't act like I was mad and it distinctly make a pose of any kind. She saw me from 150 yards away and stopped. And you could just see right then and there, her ears changed and she kind of sulked a little bit and she started trotting to me at a little bit of a hesitated pace. And as I didn't say a word, and as she came closer, she sulked a little lower and a little lower. And by the time she got to my feet, she looked like she, if she could have said it, she'd have just said, dad, I'm just so sorry. I'm just so sorry. Yep. But all she saw was my body language and she could tell I was, she could sense I was upset with her because of what she had done. And I never said anything to her. Now, when I'm real proud and happy, my body language is easy to see as well. And they look at that and go, oh, they puff their chests up a little bit. They hold their heads a little higher. There's a little swagger in their tail. Oh, yeah. That, that is, those are moments where, and you get that, you, you, you understand that through training. Because in training sessions, we have those moments where we're disappointed. And we have those moments that we're real proud. And they recognize that. And so then all of a sudden it's outside of training in the real world and they recognize it as well because it's, it's similar. It's the same type of feel that we're giving them. So uh, those are moments where you can really skyrocket a dog's confidence in what they're doing if you handle it properly, if you handle it the right way. If you don't know what the hell you're doing and you're not sure, right. they, they, they really question whether or not it, what they're doing is right either. It's yeah. they're really, we're, it's a team. It's not a, it's not a sit in your truck and let the dog fill the backup type. Yep. Of stuff. It's, it's 100%. You're going together. You're better shed hunting because of the dog and the dog's better shed hunting because of you, you put, you set them up to be in the right spot. They execute when you put them in the right spot. But if right. you, there's if one of the two are missing, it doesn't work. Yep. Uh, my dog, it, it's funny you say that, like, I'll do the training sessions out back because I got a couple acres. And when I get this guy out right here, she's going nuts. She sure. gets excited. It's funny. Sure. And then I'll, I'll change it up, though. You know, she knows when, when that's time to go. But there'll be other days where I'll just walk out there randomly, throw an antler, and come back in the evening. We're just, I don't say any command word. And it's, it's funny because she'll be trotting along, doing her thing. And she'll all of a sudden come across it. And she'll stop and she throws her head back looking at me like, sure. hey, yeah, I she's, think this is something you want, but I'm not sure, right. you know, because those you know, are those, but those are those moments. Those are those moments of a little bit of hesitation and second guess on her part. And when you confirm, yeah, that's exactly what I want. She yep. goes, oh, okay. And yep. you do that enough times and then you're going to have a light bulb turn on. But oh, that's yeah. exactly, that's exactly what you're looking for. It's exactly yep. what you need. So yeah, you can't, you can't, funny. you can't memorize a routine with the dog. You can't, you can't have the dog memorize the play. Like it's no. not a rehearsal. This isn't a rehearsal thing that you do the exact same thing. You can do that and it'll look real good for that moment in that scenario and that structured session. But once yep. you get out in the real, when you transition that to the real thing, it doesn't work. So we're not looking at trying to get a dog to memorize the answers to the test. We're trying to get a dog to understand the concept. And then yeah. when the test gets put out there and the test is a little different today than it was yesterday, they're, they understand the concept enough that they can make sense of it. Oh yeah, absolutely. And uh, 
it was just funny, but it was one of those things where it was like, as a trainer, I was like, training her, it was like, she was connecting the dots right there. And it was just a good feeling. So even in the woods, when we're doing the real life stuff, if she does that, I'm, I'm investigating that area and I'm getting her excited, but totally. Yeah. So that's, that's but, but look at it too. You two are working together in those scenarios. Yep. She's showing you a reason to go look over there. You're, you're going over there. She's feeding off of that. And if she, if all of a sudden those scent clues run out or she finds that scent clue and goes, Nope, there's not one here. I guarantee you her body language changes and she moves off and you look at her and go, she's not on it. We'll keep moving. Yep. It's just the way it is. That's, that's how you work together. Oh, yeah. So I, my dog, I've been working with her for a couple of years now. Um, been enjoying her thoroughly. Uh, what about somebody who has a six year old seasoned couch vet who won't get up unless you got a bag of potato chips, you know, what kind of things do you see there with training issues and, and how to get someone like that? involved to get their dog going well i think part of it when you as you describe it is i i question you know stamina and athletic ability you know a six you know and, and i'm i'm using what you've described and going i'm envisioning a dog that's overweight and lazy and so yeah. it's hard <laughs> so it, it would be let and maybe not la- lazy maybe is or isn't the right word but not active an inactive overweight dog so i look at that and i go if it's an inactive overweight person which I go through this. November is a really rough month on me. I gain a lot of weight in November because all I do is sit in a tree. Right, uh, right. It, it, you know, I just, it, it's, it's not my most active. October, I lose a lot of weight because I walk a lot hunting. I'm, pheas- I'm hunting grouse and woodcock and I'm putting 15 miles on a weekend. And then all of a sudden that stops and I eat and I eat less healthy. And so I have this shift in my body. And the p- hard part for me is if I want to get back into that October shape on December 1st, it's not as easy as just flipping a switch and going, oh, okay, now all of a sudden I'm going to be in shape again. It's a lot hard. It's way harder to get back into that October shape because oh, yeah. I'm out of it. So I look at it and I go, well, conditioning is important and you can't condition it all at once. Sh- training dogs is not something that goes from zero to a hundred. It doesn't go from A to Z. It goes from A to B, from B to C, from C to D. And eventually you get, if you continue on, you get to Z, but it's all incremental. And so the person that has the dog that's older, your advantage is if you've done a nice job with, or a relatively nice job with foundation to that point, you probably don't have to spend much time or nearly as much time as the person who has the puppy. Because yep. that foundation is hopefully already there. You just have to uncover right. it, knock the rust off, start utilizing it in a positive way. Shape and conditioning has to take place and it doesn't happen overnight. Just like me, I can't lose all that weight overnight. I can't get so that all of a sudden I can breathe. Like I'm <laughs> like my buddy says, I feel like I'm <laughs> bending down to tie my shoes and my eyes are going to pop out. Like, right. like it's, it, it, I'm breathing heavy coming down the stairs. So I can't decide the next day that I'm going to start running marathons. But what I could do is say, I'm going to run a marathon, but I'm going to run it in three to four months from now. And tomorrow, I'm going to just going to run 50 yards. And after that, if I can do 50 yards three days in a row, I'll be so sore after that first day of running 50 yards. It'll be unbelievable. It might take me three days to recover. But then that third day, if I decide to do it again, my recovery might take two days. And then if I do it again after that, now I'm running 50 yards and I'm going, I'm not even getting tired. I got to go 100. And then I run a hundred and I get a little bit sore, but nowhere near like I was when I ran 50 for the first. So it just slowly, and I'm not like a runner, but I have run in the past. And I realized the hardest part for me was getting past the recovery of the first day because it hurt so bad and I didn't hardly do anything. Yeah. But, but if you continue to move, if you continue to do it, you stay a little looser, you start, then you pile on with the idea of, well, maybe instead of eating a quick trip and getting chicken tenders always, <laughs> I might start getting a salad once in a while. And yeah. now all of a sudden, it's a little contagious of momentum of the idea of the activeness and the health factor. And when you start eating better, I guarantee you, you feel better. I know what happens, but it's, it's sometimes a little bit of work to eat a little oh, yeah. bit better. So you have to sacrifice that, but then all of a sudden that helps you get a little more excited and motivated about the idea of running 200, 300, 400 yards. Now I'm running miles instead of yards. So you, you get that. You, I think you take a similar approach with the dog. You don't try to do it all at once. 
you take that dog and you start getting them a little bit better physically in shape. That helps them with their nose work. A dog that's breathing out of its mouth can't breathe through its nose. They, yeah. they can't smell through their mouth. So they have to breathe through their nose. So the dog that's in better shape works better in the field because they can breathe through their nose and process scent and not be so gassed that they can't function. So there's an advantage of having your dog in good shape from a, yeah. from a scenting standpoint. So you, you start doing that. And then I think you, you look back at your foundation and you go, well, we got a pretty good foundation. So I'm going to start running some memories. I'm going to start setting up some trailing memories with, this, with that training dummy and make it simple, but make it fun, make it high reward. As far as the idea of praise, when my dogs do things right, let them know. We're real quick to let dogs know when they make a mistake. We're really quick to correct them. We're really quick to tell them no. But how often do we tell them, good job, you did well, nice. Right. So the, the idea of timing is very important in training. And when you correct something, it has to be exactly at the right moment. But you also have to understand when they do it right, you have to praise it exactly the right moment so they understand not only what is not desired, but what is desired. So I think you start incorporating some of that stuff. I, you know, our... Our, it's not real complicated to train a shed dog. I think you got to understand what the shape is. I think you got to understand what the scent is and then what to do with it when you get it. Mm -hmm. And so I, we, I like using drills like memories. I, you've seen probably some of that stuff. Oh, memories yeah. are great. Memories are great because they allow me to build a dog that's calm, quiet, and steady. They allow me to have a dog that's under control. They have a dog that understands that things don't necessarily come from my hand. I don't have to throw the dummy every time for the dog to get it. They're going to have to pick it up off the ground because the last time I checked, the antlers don't come out of my hand. They're laying yeah. on the ground and that can be a challenge for some dogs. So we get this idea of dogs picking stuff up off the ground instead of coming from our hands. And then from there, we can start working into some hunt command stuff and transitioning into cover and some scenting stuff. And so it's not, so the person that's got that older dog, I think you start in the same spot that the guy starts with the puppy, the guy or gal starts with the puppy. You start in the beginning. Yep. It's just that the, the rate of acceleration might be a little bit different because your foundation may allow you to go faster, but I guarantee you, we all have it with all of our dogs. The six-year-old dog that's real good on the couch has holes no matter how good you think they are there's going to be some holes you'll find the holes in training that's good yeah. some people are afraid to find problems in their training i think you should look for the problems you should put your dogs in positions where you'll find those issues they'll stand out and then you fix it so when you find a hole fill it in yeah if you run, in, if you run into a wall look for a door don't just try to run through the wall figure out how you're going to get through it Yep. And, and correct me if I'm wrong. I think I heard you at one point um, in one of your sessions I was listening to. I don't know if it was your podcast or not. Uh, a dog has, what is it, three seconds to um, yeah to give that. It's not even very less. long to give that. Yeah, even less. Point. Yep. I mean, it's a second to connect the idea of correct and incorrect. And it's been done in tests. They've, they've, they've done tests where like it, they have short-term memory and long-term memory. We try to develop their long-term memory from a retrieving standpoint, but the short-term memory is, is connected to the idea of learning. And so it, the timing is so important. If you, if the dog like place training is a skill that we really like, and if the dog is up on their place, it's an elevated platform. And if the dog steps off of it, if they walk off of it and take two steps and then I tell them no, they're going to think I'm telling them no for the second step that they made off the ground. What yeah. I need them to understand is the no should have been the second their foot was coming off the bed and touching the floor because the no has got to be don't come off the bed, not yeah. don't walk on the floor. So yeah. it's confusing if you're late. Now, if you're, so your timing has to be there. Now, the other thing with using place training as an example is the dog, let's say the dog comes off three, four times in a row and we tell them no, and we put them back. We tell them no and put them back. And the third time they go to the edge and they pause and you can see them think in their head and they decide they lean back and they decide to stay on the bed at that moment, the moment that they paused and prior to even leaning back, I need to be there with a good. Yeah. So that they go, Oh, this is what I'm supposed to do. If I step off, he says, no. If I stay on, he says, good. Well, that becomes a real, a lot more black and white instead of gray. And it's hard for a dog to learn if you're, if you're gray all the time, right? You gotta make it easy for him. Um, so 
timing is just very, very important. Yep. So there you go. Three seconds or less. You, I mean, right then and there, you got to hit it. Um, and, you know, you talked about it uh, being a marathon runner. You're not going to get on a treadmill and run six miles right away. You're going to die. Right. Uh, small, short sessions right then and there. Um, you know, and then you were talking about October and transitioning over into uh, to November. Um, and when we're transitioning out of hunting seasons, as a guy who works, you know, 50 hours a week, how much time is sufficient enough to work with your dog um, once the season is officially over? Well, I don't, I don't put, I don't measure anything by time. Okay. I don't set it on, hey, I need a five minute session, 15 minute session, 10 minute. I, I look at it and I go, it depends on how the dog's doing. Sometimes we can go a little bit more. Sometimes we go a little bit less. I, I try to adopt the idea of we're not going to, dogs are always learning. So we're always going to be training. I might not have a session. I might not have a formal session with a dog for a week. I might not go out and do anything formal with them, specifically building on any skill set. The last two weeks, because of the cold weather prior to prior to last week, we did not do a lot of work outside. Yeah, the vortex. That, <laughs> that doesn't mean that we didn't train. So okay. what I did, what like I've got two dogs right here, one over there, and one in the kennel right now. I've got four dogs here in my house, and they're in training right now. I'm busy doing this. I'm running around doing that they're on their place they're understanding hey now this isn't the first day that they've done this they've done this for a long long time this is a cultural thing this is a lifestyle thing that we've had them learn right. but with a young dog i could set up i might have a podcast to record with jerry at two so i'm going to work on that dog's not place trained yet so i'm not going to set it up to be jumping off the place and screwing around in here while i'm on the podcast and can't pay attention to him so that's dogs gonna go in the kennel that's training yeah. That's, training. that's the understanding of I'm, I'm separate. I'm going to be quiet. I'm not going to have the ability to make a mistake. Training sometimes is avoiding bad habits as much as it is forming good ones. So mm -hmm. by me allowing that dog to not make the mistake and not be able to be there to correct or praise that's training. So it's, yeah. you know, I'm going to have to go down and um, I'm going to have to go down and put the garbage out tomorrow, probably. So I can put the dog on a lead and I can work on some heel work and I can walk the dog down to the dumpster and throw the garbage in the dumpster that I got to put that garbage out no matter what. So right. I might as well get training out of it and I'm going to build in some good solid heel work. And if the dog is to the point where we're starting to work off lead, I might work the dog off lead a little bit. If not, we'll put it on the lead. So instead of me leaving the dog in the house and going to put the garbage out, or instead of me just letting the dog go free run, I turned it into a session of heel work. I've got a dog that's the opposite right now, has a real hard time getting out, wants to be in heel all the time. So that dog, I might do the opposite. That one, I'll go out, put the garbage out, but I'll let that dog, I'll try to encourage that dog to get out in quarter. It's training. It didn't yeah. take me any more time because I had to do that stuff anyway. Excellent. Excellent. Well, speaking of time, I've taken quite a bit of yours. I just want to get a couple uh, uh, listener questions out sure. that people ask me. Uh, you bet. We'll be wrapping this up. Yeah. Um. Let me just turn this on quick, Jerry. Yeah, no problem. Okay. Okay, so I got uh, three of them. And a couple of them we might be kind of piggybacking on to from previous answers, uh, which is kind of nice. But here's one here, and it says, when training my dog, my dog is running around uh, like crazy, but her nose is to the ground eyes wide open. I feel like she's missing sheds. Is this normal? And if not, how do I slow her down? Well, is it normal? For some dogs, it will be. For some, it won't. I, my question would be, are you finding sheds that she's not? Because I, you know, I, I got to, I get, the, the, if, if the dog's running around and not finding any antlers and you're not finding any either, there might not be any antlers there. Yeah. So, if the dog is running past antlers continuously and you're seeing them, yeah, you've got a little bit of an issue there. So slow down. So how do I slow a dog down? I slow, I slow down. Dogs oftentimes feed off of us. So I'd be, I'd ask this person, you know, what is your pace usually like? Are you go, 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 go? Cause that's what the dog will do. Yeah. I, I see that all the time in every, my dogs, my dogs are pretty, pretty, pretty cool, pretty calm. Part of it has to do with genetics and, and the, their natural demeanor. Part of it has to do with culturally, that's what we really try to emphasize. 
I slow everything down with the dogs. It allows for a dog to work slower. You know, I've had some people ask me about, you know, my dog likes to track fast. How do I slow it down? Well, in training, there are ways you can do it. I think you can age the track a little bit longer, make it, make it a little more challenging. Because I'll ask, you know, well, how, how does your setup look? Well, I drag the line, I go back and get the dog, and then we track it. Wow. That's like asking a, you know, that's like asking them to put a three-piece puzzle together. Like, right. not that hard. But if you give them a hundred piece puzzle, they can't go at the same pace that they did the three piece puzzle. So you make it a little more challenging. So the idea of, you know, if the dog wants to work real fast, I work until the dog gets moving too fast and then I stop and I tell the dog to stop. Mm -hmm. And then I take a deep breath and we pause. Okay. And now the dog starts to ramp up, stop them. Ramp up, stop. So what this will do is this will force you to slow way down. Here's the question. Are you patient enough to do that? Or are you going to go, I can't go at this pace. I got to get going. Because then you're answering your own question. Why does your dog go so fast? Because you go so fast. So slow down. Okay. Um, And then the next one is, um, and this actually has to do with your your antler right here. Um, This guy. The dog bone antler is a little bigger than what my area holds. Does this matter or will they still be able to find like the four points and spikes? Well, I think you train with different stuff. I think that's a good place to start that training dummy. It's because of the material. It's because of what it can do for you in a positive way. I think it's the same answer could be, you know, this could be the exact same answer for the person that messages me from Montana that says that's a lot smaller than the elk antlers and the mule deer antlers that we're going to find. Will it pick up the bigger ones? My answer would be shape is shape and general shape is, you know, no two sheds look the same. So we're going to use that as a, as a benchmark, a baseline to get started. But then if I want them picking up elk antlers or I want them picking up moose paddles, or I want them picking up mule deer, you know, hundred inch mule deer sides, I'm going to have to work some of that in no different than if I want to pick, if I want a dog to pick up a Canadian goose, I'm going to have to, I I don't train with a teal. So, but I want dogs picking up birds. So early on uh, the, the easier thing for them to pick up is the teal. So I use little birds to start out with, and then I incrementally get bigger and bigger and bigger until I've got, you know, I've got some big farm ducks, big Aflac ducks. They look like the duck from Aflac. I keep those frozen in my freezer because that's kind of like a Canada goose. So right. I, I have different shapes and sizes of stuff. I've got a dog right now that we're training for Upland and we, we've in, intentionally have been using hen pheasants because they're a lot smaller than these big roosters that we have. So we have not shot any roosters over here. We've been shooting hens over here because it's a smaller, more manageable bird. The idea is build the confidence in her with it, and then we'll start getting bigger. So I think if you're concerned with, you know, we got a lot of spikes and forks, I'm starting out with that training dummy because it works because of the shape and the feel and the ability for them to retrieve it, have it feel good in their mouth and not poke themselves or jab themselves. Then go to a spike or fork and use that as well. Then go to a great big five point side eventually when the confidence is there. But you got to get, we want, I want to have these dogs understand that there is a variety of stuff out there that counts. That counts yeah. too. Cool. Well, very, very good answer. Uh, so, you know, you've given us a plethora of information and I, I can't thank you enough for that. Um, that man. Where, where can anybody go to, uh, to see what you got going on? I know you've had some great episodes coming out um, and uh, anything about you. Yeah, our, our so social media is probably the best at you at Dogbone Hunter is all of our stuff. It's YouTube. Um, Dogbone Hunter is our YouTube, uh, Instagram and Facebook. Those are the ones we use the most. Um, our website is dogbonehunter.com. And so though that's the best place to probably start and, and dig into some of the stuff. Our, our YouTube is a, is a platform that we're really trying to, to utilize a lot more. Um, it's, it, fits really well it works really well and you know it with youtube yep. stuff it just is, is a great place for people to get get information and yeah. we are putting a, a lot of time and effort into creating playlists creating series um creating different content pieces that hopefully bring some value to the person that wants to train their own dog um social media is social media so like facebook works a little bit different for us than their instagram but i do think that each one of them has 
a, a value in its own kind of world. Um, if you're into podcasts, we have a podcast out called it's uh, dog. It's the dog bone podcast, but P uh, P A W D C A S T. You can just type in dog bone hunter or dog bone. It'll come up, um, but that's available on all the apps, you know, all the podcast apps. So podcast is a little bit different than the video blogs and the video right. blogs are a little different than the playlists. And, but, but those are, I think the best places to start. We've got training. We've got a series of training videos that I don't talk about that often. Those are really well produced and, and formally sequenced. You can get all the information if you watch our YouTube, but there's probably 10,000 hours of stuff there to get yeah. the three hours of focus sequence stuff that we do in the video. So, you know, it just depends on how you like to consume your stuff. And um, our, 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 we provide products that I use and have designed and worked well and work well for me. We, we really feel like we need to provide the information about how to use them in order for them to be beneficial. And so that's one of our yeah. missions is help others that are looking to do their training um, by giving them the information to support the use of the product. Yep. Well, you know, I've seen you post quite a few uh, Facebook, or sorry, uh, YouTube posts uh, throughout the week, uh, sure. sometimes as much as a couple of days. So yeah. you know, like you said, there's a lot of information. Anybody out there looking to uh, to work with their dog, Jeremy's the guy. Um, we got Shed Rally coming up here March 13th and 14th. Uh, we want to give you guys some awesome product uh, from Jeremy over at Dogbone. We got one of his antler kits. We got some scents. All you got to do is uh, come on over to our Facebook page, Drop Tine Ridge, drop us a like, and under the, uh, the official shed post, just give it us a like or, uh, or drop a picture of your favorite hunting activity. And while you're at it, go visit Jeremy on over at Dogbone Hunter on uh, either YouTube, Facebook, or uh, dogbonehunter.com. Uh, thank you again, Jeremy. I really appreciate it, buddy. It was my pleasure, Jerry. I appreciate you having me.